temptation of your kingdom breaking through I want to move so you can move Come and do what only you can do I want to live in expectation of your kingdom breaking through are open and my heart is free open the heavens rain down on me fall down on me my hands are open my heart is free open the heavens rain down on me fall down on me There's nothing more powerful than the open hand. Mother Teresa once said, when I grasp things tightly, Jesus has to pry my hands open and it hurts. So she said she learned to live with an open hand. And, uh, and the power you have in your life when you live with an open hand is just amazing. You'll look back at your life when you go, really, God, you were able to use me for that, for this. City Lights is really about creating this massive army of love with open hands and uh it's it is it is getting started you gotta understand it's not there could not have been a worse time for city lights to launch nor a best time best time because it's a time for service worst time because you can't gather like we would like to but city lights is beginning to move and so you'll begin to see the regional kiosk out in the in our atrium, if you ever are, are in attendance in our building, you'll, you'll begin to hear more about our gatherings. For example, one that took place last Saturday night with the South Region. And so be on the alert for that.
We want you to have an open hand. We want you to live out what is our first core value, and that's generosity, because freely you have received, freely give. We also want you to see your life as fully redemptive. God doesn't waste a pain. God doesn't waste a crisis. God doesn't waste a penny. And the life of Amber Laris is one that for a number of years, I know I myself have been able to see God's redemptive work in her life. It's so powerful. Uh, take a listen. Yeah, you know what? I was a daddy's girl, for sure. <laughs> From what I understand, I'm a lot like him. Just such a fun-loving guy. I mean, I would have loved to have known him as an adult. Uh, he died when I was 13, really unexpectedly. It seems like that was the shift for me. You know, before that, I really felt like I had my head on straight. You know, I, I, was, I wasn't gonna drink before. I wasn't gonna drink underage. I wasn't gonna have premarital sex. I was gonna be the girl that I was raised to be. And then when you fall short, I think that whole image just kind of crumbles and, and, you're, and you're wondering, what, where did I go wrong? You know, my very first relationship, my very first time, um, within just a few weeks I found out that I was pregnant and I was only 16 years old. I mean, the only thing that I kept thinking about is what will people think of me? I wanted to go to college and I had all these dreams and I didn't want to miss the next party, if we're being honest. What I wanted to do was fix the problem. When I found out I was pregnant, I mean, I couldn't even, <laughs> I couldn't even consider anything else. I went straight to a Planned Parenthood and they gave me an abortion pamphlet and said, here's what you can do. I knew that God did not want that for me. But I also felt a little bit like it was still my choice. Cause I remember thinking if it's legal, it can't be that, it can't be that wrong. Um, even though in my gut, I knew something wasn't right with God, like that I would, ha and I remember, unfortunately, I even remember um, saying out loud that I would, I would deal with that with God later. But this is what I would, this is what had to happen right now. I know some people deal with things differently, but in my case, it happened, I shut it out and I moved on with my life. I didn't mourn, I didn't spend time grieving. So I finished high school and went on to college, the same plan that I had in place. Um, what's really interesting about this scenario and how it played out though is I have a good friend now who, um, she was just a couple years younger than me, but her life ended up mirroring mine in that she got pregnant at 16 had a baby in high school. So basically her life was lived out opposite of what I chose. Like I chose abortion, she chose life. And what I saw play out in her life was a complete redemption story that I, it was so inspiring to me because I lived, I watched her go through high school and still um, do all the amazing things you get to do in high school and experience all the awesome high school things. We both went to Ohio University. So I went to college with her and she was there with her baby and lived in a house and took care of her baby and went to college. But she, at the time she chose life, she chose to recommit herself to Christ. And she became this walking example of what it looked like. It was about like my late 20s when I just, I was kind of over living this lifestyle, you know? And that is when I met my husband. And I remember the first thing I remember thinking about him, he's different, he's a good guy, you know? Like he's this really great guy. So this is the crazy thing. I was going through the volunteer training at the Miami Valley Women's Center and I was learning all these things about what abortion was. And I was going through the healing process of what it meant to come through the other side of that that trauma. I had never faced my abortion, literally ran from it my whole entire life. At the exact same time of that training is when Rob and I were in the process of trying to have our first child. <laughs> and though I was I was so wrecked. I mean I I could not believe what I had done. You know, I mean the realization of what I had done for the first time in like my whole young adult life, it finally sunk in and I was so broken. 
and I didn't feel worthy. Like, I just begged for God to forgive me. Because I wanted a baby so bad. I wanted to have a child, and I was married, and... But I just didn't feel worthy. The end of your um, abortion recovery Bible session, you actually get to um, create a plaque for your child. And so they have um, they have a garden that you have out back where all of the plaques are, and you have your baby's name on it, and and it's closure that I never had before that I didn't know I needed. What the enemy meant for evil, what he was trying to do to harm me and to take me out, God is going to use it for good. <laughs> and that's the exciting thing. That's what I'm excited about because I know that my story is meant to be heard because I don't want one single person to have to go through what I went through. I believe that God spent the last few years preparing me for right now. From that, I decided to go ahead and move forward with starting a community group. I want to give people the opportunity to find the freedom and the forgiveness that I found. And um, I'm really excited about the opportunity to partner with the Women's Center to put together this abortion recovery ministry that is walking people through the steps of healing and forgiveness. I feel like because of everything that I've gone through, I appreciate what I have so much more. I mean, I appreciate every single day with my kids. Like I've got these two sweet boys now. I've got two little boys that are like the biggest blessing in my whole entire life. And I am so blessed that I found this husband who's this godly man. I am forgiven and I am redeemed and I am a child of the Most High God. Hello everyone. I've known Amber a long time and her heart is to serve, especially those whose lives are in that redemptive process. And I hope you were as moved by that as I was to say, God, thank you that I'm a part of a movement of serving even out of our woundedness we uh, are in a series, One Light, as you saw, and the series is about the one another's of the New Testament. More than ever, we need to understand the one another reality. It's so critical within the church and, of course, the church's relationship to the world. And this is really interesting today as we look at serve one another in love in light of this reality. The American idol is autonomy. Do you know that? Look at your own life. Look, everything about America is about autonomy. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm free. Now, look at these words. Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. You were called to be free. This is the emphasis of the whole letter of the Galatians is spiritual freedom. Uh, as a matter of fact, earlier in this chapter, Paul said, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Chapter 5, verse 1, stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So he would say to Amber, to you, to me, you've come into my amazing grace now, don't let yourselves be ensnared in the bounds of your, of your guilt, of your shame, of legalistic systems. Don't be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Now, here's what's interesting about this. There's an actor, John Cleese, that many of you have seen. He's a British actor. And he said something that is the reason why Galatians was written. It's the reason why it's critical we deal with this every once in a while within our faith community. He said, Western religion is 1% divine interaction and 99% crowd control. 
So many reasons why people reject faith and organized religion is because many people see that a lot of what comes across as religion is really just crowd control. It's, it's using guilt, using shame, using rules to control people because we say if we remove the restrictions, then people will live like they want. Yes, that's right. They will. If you don't try to guilt people into right behavior, the true person will emerge. And this is what Paul deals with in Galatians when he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Now live in the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentle self-control. All those will emerge in your life. You see, what we always need to understand, especially those of you who grew up in religious systems, is the cross is not about making it possible for us to earn our way to God. The cross of Christ, Jesus dying in our place, removes the age-old concept that you have to be perfect to be saved. You have to be perfect to earn your favor with God. You have to obey scriptural admonitions rightly. You, you even have to confess rightly when you do transgress. And grace comes in, this amazing grace that we learned last week that is beyond mercy, mercy being withholding punishment, grace being undeserved favor. I have forgiven you and I have adopted you and I've restored you. And look at this, when His grace hits us, we realize that all the time and energy we have given to proving ourselves, proving our significance, proving our lovability, proving our worth, no longer necessary. Now we are free. We are to live like we want, but we are free to serve one another. See, when you're in a journey to prove your significance, you don't have the time to serve other people. Now, you may fake it every once in a while. You may engage in servitude because you do things that are making you look better, that are outside strictures put upon yourself to conform to societal demands and expectations. But once you have trusted, I am a beloved child of the Most High God with supreme value and worth just as I am today, my resume will never improve over what Jesus has done for me that I could not do for myself. And that brings security. And security is what brings a sense that I am empowered to serve. I am free from being self-absorbed. I am free from being insecure. I'm free to serve. My good friend Mike Holweger gave me a quote a few weeks ago that I love. He said, confidence isn't thinking you're better than everyone else. Confidence is realizing that you have no reason to compare yourself to anyone else. And I personally believe this is what comes with Christ. I know you're listening to this and the old wiring of proving yourself and earning God's favor and earning the approval of others is still systemically embedded into your DNA. This is what growth is all about, is growth is growing in the reality that Jesus Christ is my significance. And that becomes my dominant modus operandi that allows me to be the one who takes the towel and the basin and gets on my knees and serves because I don't have anything to prove. Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my apprentices, my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And if the sun sets you free, then you will be freed indeed. That is so contrary to the American way of, I'm free to do what I want. Paul says, no, in Christ we are free to serve. That life doesn't come from self-indulgence and self-expression. Life actually comes when being made secure, you serve. You will not hear that in American culture. But this is the transcendent impact of the gospel. It's why it creates different human beings. It's so different. Look at these words, Galatians 
5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Yeah, you're free. You don't, you don't have to do anything. That's amazing, isn't it? But don't use that to indulge flesh. Rather, serve one another in love because the entire law, verse 14, is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Look at how this reads in the Message Bible. It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Isn't that interesting? That, that America is more enslaved than ever because we think we ought to be more free than ever. We're actually more enslaved. We become enslaved to our passions. Rather, he says, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence, love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. And Jesus embodied what I want to be. I want to be free like this. That I don't have to compare myself to other people. I'm confident enough in who he is in me to be free to serve. And that's its reward. So still to this day, the first, when I went to Bible college, the first passage of scripture that my professor of preaching, Bob Stacy made us memorize was John chapter 13, Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And to this day, these words still resonate so deeply with me when it says, Jesus knew at the Last Supper, is the context, that the Father had put all things under his power, that had put him in complete charge of everything, that he came from God and was on his way back to God. So he got up from the table, set aside his robe, put on an apron, Look at that. Look at that connection. He knew where he had come from. He knew who he was and where he was going. So he got up, set aside his robe, put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin, began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. You don't have to be a student of the Bible to know what an act of debasement that is. What an act of servanthood and it literally was in that culture the most servile thing you could do and he freely did it why because he knew where he came from he knew who he was now and how empowered he was and he knew where he was going look at this this is the sermon in a sentence listeners it is the savior who grows security security grows service and service grows self It's the way it works. High school students who are listening to this, you live in a culture that says the way to self is self-expression. Find yourself. Be everything you can be. And you'll hear that. That's actually not true. The way to life is to grow in an inner security so much that you're that person who can serve and you don't need to know that you're significant. I'm not there yet but I'm growing there. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I'm going to be, but I'm not what I was. And you can be too. There's a a great story. I just love this. And I found this in my files. I'd forgotten about this story. And it's told from a a guy who was a football player at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. And he tells this story. One day when I was a freshman in high school, I saw a kid from my class walking home from school. His name was Kyle. It looked like he was carrying all of his books. And I thought to myself, why would anyone bring home all his books on a Friday? He must really be a nerd. And he said, you know, here's me. I had quite a weekend ahead of me, parties and a football game with my friends. Tomorrow afternoon, uh, this guy was the BMOC. He was the big man on campus. So I shrugged my shoulders and I went on. And as I was walking, I saw a bunch of kids running toward this fellow freshman. They ran at him, they knocked all his books out of his arms and tripped him, so he landed in the hallway. His glasses went flying, they fell about 10 feet from where he had fallen. And he said, he looked up, and I'll never forget what I saw. I didn't see anger. I saw this terrible sadness in his eyes. I, I saw a person who had given up. And he said, my heart went out to him. So I jogged over to him. And as he crawled around on the hall floor looking for his glasses, I saw a tear in his eyes. And as I handed him his glasses, I said, those guys are jerks. They need to get a life. 
And he looked at me and he said, thanks. And it wasn't a superfluous, oh, thanks. It was a genuine look of value. Big smile on his face. It was one of those smiles that showed authentic gratitude. And I helped him pick up his books and he asked me, uh, I asked him where he lived. And come to find out, he lived not very far from where I lived. And, and I asked him why he'd, I'd never seen him before. I'd never seen him in, in, in that general neighborhood, but I'd never seen him at school. And he said he'd gone to private school before this calendar school year. And he said, I would have never hung out with a private school kid before. We talked all the way home as I walked with him and I carried his books. He turned out to be a pretty cool kid. I asked him what he wanted, uh, what he want to play football with us this coming Saturday. And he said, yeah. And uh, with my friends and myself, and he said, yeah. And we hung out all weekend. The more I got to know Kyle, the more I liked him. My friends thought the same of him. Monday morning came and there was Kyle with this huge stack of books again. I stopped him and I said, man, you're really going to build some serious muscles with this pile of books every day that you're carrying. And he laughed and he handed me half the books. And over the next four years, Kyle and I became really, really good friends. When we were seniors, we began to think about college. He eventually went on to Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And he would be, get, he would be a doctor. I was going to go to Duke where I would play football and study business. We knew with the friendship we developed that the, the distance would separate us, that we would always be friends. And we were, we have been. But Kyle became the valedictorian of our high school class. I, I teased him all the time about being a nerd. But he had to prepare a speech, as you know, that valedictorians have to do for graduation. I was so glad it was he who was speaking and not me that had to get up there and speak. And graduation day, I saw Kyle and he looked great. He was one of those guys who really found himself during high school. He filled out, he looked good in glasses even. Uh, I think he had more dates than I did. All the girls just loved him because he was just so cute and, and smart and gentle. And um, sometimes I was kind of jealous of him. And today was one of those days. But I could see that he was really nervous about his speech. So I smacked him on the back and I said, hey, big guy, you're going to be great. And he looked at me with one of those looks and his nerd smile. And he said, thanks. And he started to, to go up and he started his speech and he cleared his throat and he began to talk to this gathering of parents and fellow graduates, teachers and administrators. Graduation is time where you thank people who have helped you get through this journey and some tough years in high school, um, especially your friends. And he stood up and he said, you know, I know this is a time to say thank you to our parents and to our teachers and to our siblings and coaches. And I want to say that I'm up here because there's nothing more important than you can be than a friend. That the best way you can serve someone, be a gift to someone is to just be their friend. Uh, let me tell you a story. And he begins to tell this story. And I look at my friend with disbelief as he told the story of our first day meeting in that hallway where his books were knocked out of his arms as freshmen. He told this crowd of people that he had planned to harm himself over that weekend. He talked about how he had cleaned out his locker so his mom wouldn't have to do it later. And he was carrying all his stuff home. And he glanced over at me and he gave me a little smile. And he said, thankfully I was saved. My friend saved me from doing the unspeakable. He said, I heard this subtle gasp go through the crowd as this handsome, popular, bright boy told all of us about his most vulnerable moment. I saw his mom and dad looking at me and smiling that same grateful smile. And not until that moment did I realize it's incredible depth. Now, not every story is that dramatic, but you live in a world where that person close to you, your neighbor, that person close to you has had the books knocked out of their arms. And there has never been a more urgent time to hear the words of Scripture, serve one another in love. Who's that person today who needs to have their books picked up? 
Now, if you're hearing this and you're saying, boy, I hope someone listens to this because they'll pick up my books. Maybe you need help. But I implore you, you be that person. You allow the Savior to grow security in you. In Jesus, we have the security of the big man on campus. <laughs> Wait, we are resourced. You allow that security to grow service in you, not servitude, I have to, but service, I get to. And you allow that service to grow yourself. Because Jesus said, anyone who wants to find their life will lose their life. But if you will lose your life for me and my gospel, you will find your life. You will find yourself.
Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. God, I came here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine.